All right, I think we are good. Don't forget the quizzes are due. Check them out. I did move the or change the life cycle quizzes. Um, so you have three attempts. I'll, I'll take the highest score of the three attempts. That'll give you extra practice on the life cycles because uh, we do have quite a few. We have quite a few. We're almost to the halfway point of the week and halfway point of the semester. So we'll see. We'll see what, what we can do. Any questions? All right. This is where we left off. So we are GI tract residents. All right. This is these are the non-stickosome bearing. All right. So what we're talking about now are hookworms. But we will be talking about like Ascaris and Camelanus and Pinworm and so forth. All right. So we had evolution, or these life cycles could evolve in two different ways. Uh, and, it, and we suspect that they have evolved a couple different, different times uh, in a couple different families. So it wasn't you had it evolve once and then that gave rise to all the parasites uh, that live in the gut. Uh, you probably had this multiple, multiple evolution. And so what we're going to do is talk about hookworms. So this is class Chromodoria, family Ancelostomidae, Ankylostomidae. Common name is hookworm. All right. They're named for the anterior end that makes them appear like a shepherd's hook. All right, so... Don't be confused. A lot of people would say it's they're named because the posterior of the tail is hooked. No, the males usually have a slight, the male nematodes usually have a slight curvature or maybe a strong curvature to their tail, but not all of them. Like our hookworms have a bursa. Right. Instead, these hookworms kind of have a slight curvature that makes it almost look like a hook, um, and so they name the hookworm. Morphology is similar across all of them, and a key feature of our hookworms is this. Their buccal capsule. Right? The buccal capsule is hardened. It's sclerotized. That's that's what what sclerotized means. And it's going to be armed with cutting plates, cutting teeth, teeth or lancets and or lancets. So this is a good one. If you look at Ancelosma brasiliensis, which we have in our lab, uh, a couple of them are facing up, and you can see these teeth. They're used for cutting. They're going to cut the gut mucosa. They're going to feed on the blood of the host. All right? They're going to feed on blood of the host. Males in hookworms have a well-developed copulatory bursa. I wouldn't say that this is unique to the hookworms, but hookworms, the male hookworms, do have a bursa, and we see them in the lab. The eggs are thin-walled, which means they're going to be susceptible to desiccation. And we'll talk about some adaptations, or, or at least their epidemiology, that supports, or at least that is explained by the thin wall and the chance of desiccation. Our larval stages, they're gonna, our life cycles, again, we're nematodes, so we're going J1, J2, J3, J4 adult, all right? But we have two different esophagus types in our juveniles. So in our J1 and J2, we have what is called a rhabditiform esophagus. A rhabditiform esophagus. This esophagus type, I don't think, I don't, can't remember if I have it. I think I have it on the next slide. Yeah, they have a rhabditiform esophagus, and we'll get to the, the description of it uh, after the life cycles. But that esophagus is characteristic of bacteriovore nematodes. It's characteristic of the free living nematodes that feed on bacteria. So it's a feeding type of esophagus. The J3s have what's called the filariform esophagus. It's, it's much less muscular, which suggests that these are non-feeding. And for good reason, these guys retain that J2 cuticle. So they remain encapsulated inside the J2 cuticle. All right, and we're going to see these esophagus in the life cycles on our next slide. So you ready? Ready? 
All right, so our life cycle is similar for all hookworms. And what we're going to do is to go through our life cycle. Right, so where's my cursor? cycle for hookworms. So we're going to talk about a couple different species of hookworms, but this is just our generic life cycle. Adults are going to reside in the small intestine. Adults are going to reside in the small intestine. The adults are going to mate, and they are going to release eggs in the feces. All right. That egg is going to hatch releasing the J1. The J1 is going to feed, and in about two to three days, this changes, they will molt. Right, so they'll molt in about two to three days to the J2. J2 is going to feed, They're going to feed in about for about five days, and then they molt to the J3 stage. And this J3 may retain the J2 cuticle. May retain. These are going to rest out in the soil. They're going to hang out there until our next host comes around. All right? So they are going to sense an increase in warmth, and they're going to sense fatty acids, oils, on the surface of the skin, and that's going to stimulate what's called a penetration behavior. that gets them in contact and starts to penetrate through the actual skin of our host. All right, so we are in the environment. And our host is, will be a dog or a human. Depends on our species, depends on our species. So that's where somebody may have asked, hey, I put Britannia, and it's Tinea saginata, and I put pig or cattle. Yeah, you had to know which one it was based on the species. Just like this one, you're going to need to know it's a dog or human based on the species that I ask for. But we penetrate into the skin. The cuticle gets dropped. And our J3 is going to be in the blood or lymphatic system. Blood or lymphatic system. Now if they're in the blood, that's great because J3s are going to utilize the circulatory system to get to the heart. If they find their way into the lymphatic system, they will then travel their way to lymph nodes, right, and then cramp, cross over into the circulatory system because they need to go to the heart. From the heart, they go to the lungs. Let me say 
this. They're going to get to the lungs, and then when they get to the lungs, right, the capillaries go around the alveolar spaces of the lungs, where your gas exchange is going to be taking place. So they're going to get to those alveolar spaces, and then they're going to burst out, and they're going to be inside the lung itself. All right? So once we get inside the lung, we will now, they will now undergo their migration up the lung to the trachea, to the glottis, where as it's making its way, you're going to do a cough, followed by a swallow, which gets our J3 now back to the small intestine. Yeah, I guess there's a possibility that it's going to travel up to the glottis and then come back down the esophagus. Possibility. But normally what happens is there's going to be uh, irritation that develops in the lungs. A ciliary action is going to be moving stuff on. And then you're going <coughs> to cough, cough up some lung fluid, which happens to have a J3. So you swallow it down. And now they are finally back to the place where they belong. Their home. Where are they now? Molt to the J4 stage, molt to the adult stage, and we have now completed our life cycle. Alright, so it's cough and, and swallow. This is carried to the glottis. ciliary action. So we've got some cilia uh, in the lung epithelia. epithelium. Epithelium. Uh, if we get junk down in there and stuff, it's, it's going to try to sweep it up, try to get out of the lung. <coughs> <coughs> Must have hookworms. <laughs> All right, any questions? Couple things. Eggs are not the only ones that are susceptible to desiccation. All of those J1, J2, J3s, they're all susceptible to desiccation. All right, they're susceptible to drying out. They're also susceptible to freezing. All right, they're also susceptible to freezing. So if we think about where are we going to find these hookworms, all right, you're gonna more likely, you're most likely to find them in areas where the soil will be moist, right, that prevents the desiccation, and where you're going to have a fairly long warm season means you're not going to go up to the Arctic. It's too cold. It's frozen for too long. Our, our worms won't have a, a, enough of a chance to get, complete their life cycle, get out of the host and get find a new host. All right, so we're going to really be finding these in warmer areas, more humid areas, which would you call us a, a humid area up here? Not really. Not really. But if we go out to, let's say, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, South Carolina. Would you consider that warm and humid? Yep, Southeast United States. Popular, popular place for hookworms. All right, the other thing. Warmer temps equal faster development. Which means thus uh, our transmission rates could be higher in these warmer areas could have faster spread. And the other aspect of it is 
we're going to feed on bacteria and fecal matter. All right, so that the J1s, J2s, they have those rhabditiform esophagus type. They're going to be feeding. They're the feeding esophagus type. All right, what else? <clears throat> This is our life cycle. This is the path for our humans. Any of the human hookworms, this is what, it, what it's going to look like. Our dog hookworms have, can have a slightly different migration route. All right? So we have penetration here. It is possible that some of the dogs will go around uh, and let's say they eat dirt or eat feces where they have a chance of consuming a J3. So the J3 can now penetrate the mucous membranes of the throat to get into the blood or lymphatic system and undergo this migration. Alternatively, if they avoid it, there's some evidence now that the dog hookworm, they could get swallowed and when that J3 gets to the stomach, they don't undergo the migration. They just start developing. Slide on our slide. And our last one for the dog hookworm. Some of these J3s may be migrating through the body and they could end up in the mammary glands where the J3s can now be transferred to the nursing young. And that's in dogs, not humans. So the dog hookworms have kind of a more complex type of life cycle, more options than the humans. And I kind of present it because we have Anc Ancelosma caninum dog hookworm in the lab, or ankylostoma, or ankylostomum, a bunch of different ones. All right, so did you get this? Yes? How long can an adult live, and what is the lifespan? Good question. Good question. We will talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> it varies based on species. Sometimes it could be couple months, sometimes it could be a year, maybe a little over a year. We'll talk about that. All right, so let's go back to here. So as we said, life cycle has a similar pattern for all hookworms. Human hookworms penetrate the skin or mucosa. So you could get it, you could rub it on your eyes, your nose, or whatever. All right, dog hookworm, uh, they can swallow it. And if the J3 gets down to the stomach, they don't necessarily need to, to migrate. Now, the migration is, is important. Why migrate? Well, if you're penetrating through the skin, you have to migrate to get to, to, get to the GI tract. But once you're, in the G, once you're in the stomach, there's something there that maybe the worm just says, I have to migrate to make sure that I keep those genes because we're not always going to be swallowed. Perhaps that's the explanation. Who knows? Right. But as I said, we also have possibility of transmammary transmission. And I didn't put it up there, but you also have possibility of transplacental transmission. So it's in the blood, and then it gets transferred through the umbilical cord to that developing, uh, developing pup. I guess I should have put that up there. <clears throat> All right, all right, our esophagus types. J1 and J2s have this rhabditiform esophagus. We have slides of two larval stages. One should be a rhabditiform, the other should be a filariform. You can look at them if you want. They're pretty hard to tell. If anything, the rhabditiform, you can usually make out where the nerve ring is. You can normally see where that nerve ring is uh, on the rhabditiform esophagus. But I 
think it's a little bit harder to really take a look at it and, and identify it on the scopes that we that we have. I think we need a little bit more contrast. So what is a rhabditiform esophagus? A rhabditiform esophagus is an esophagus type that is broken up into a couple different parts. Now it's muscular all throughout, right? but we're going to have a, a procorpus, a metacorpus, an isthmus, and then a bulb, an esophageal or pharyngeal bulb. So it's all muscular, but what you have is procorpus, a slight enlargement of the metacorpus, and then you have a narrowing, and that narrowing is probably due to the nerve ring that is present there. All right, so that narrowing represents our isthmus. And then you have your esophageal or uh, pharyngeal bulb that is helping to push food down through the gut. A filariform esophagus type does not have that. It does not have the metacorpus or the isthmus. So it just basically has, you know, muscular esophagus, maybe, depending on how the worm is prepared, maybe you'll be able to see the enlargement of the bulb. Maybe it's your mind playing tricks on you. Or at least you think your mind's playing tricks on you. Because it, it shrunk. But the rhabditiform esophagus type is characteristic of feeding. Bacteria for it. It's got a strong muscular front end, so it could grab the bacteria and the sucking action can break the bacterial cell wall so it can feed on the contents. Because these guys are pretty small. J1s are pretty small. I do ask you to know diagrams. So if I were to have an unlabeled diagram like this, be able to identify the different parts of it. And to identify that this is a rhabditiform esophagus. Or if I hand draw it, and just do a mock esophagus type. What type is it? Where are the parts? All right. So then for our filariform, it's just basically the procorpus all the way down until we get to the bulb. Ready? All right. So. We've got two species that we're going to talk about. These are two human hookworms, I should say. We've got two human hookworms that we're going to talk about. We'll also talk about a dog hookworm, too. So we have Nicator americanus and Ancelostoma duodenale. Uh, Ancelostoma is, can be pronounced many different ways uh, at our the fall parasitology meeting. Uh, it was online. During the business meeting, they ran a poll, and they had something like 11 or 12 different pronunciations of this. And you'd think that you'd have one or two that would have, like, the highest response. Nope. It was all across the board. So your pronunciation is, will be based on how I learned it, which is ancillosoma. <laughs> all right. You can say ankylostoma, ancillostoma, or it's not even just like the, is it... Hard C or soft C is a, a long O or a short O, but it's also where do you put your emphasis? Ankylostoma. Ankylostoma. Somebody else. There's a bunch of different stuff. Anyways. All right, so Nicator Americanus. These, are, these kind of represent the two uh, genres. So you can kind of see the difference in their bursa and in their, their buccal plates. So just morphologically, <clears throat> Ankylostoma an ancelostoma usually has teeth, cutting teeth, whereas Nicator usually utilizes plates. They function the same. Right? So you could say we've got teeth ser serrations versus smooth edged knife. That's kind of a, a dis distinguishing feature. But Nicator is skin penetration only. All right, it has to go through the skin. Most likely, where do you think the most likely place they're going to penetrate? Where do you think? Feet? Who said that? Feet? All right. Why feet? Yeah, because they're in the soil. Where else? That's probably number one. 
No, what other part of the body are they most likely? In the mouth. Because maybe they don't think pick it up if you don't. Ancelosma can, can do that. It can go through oral mucosa. That's probably the one of the last ones. What's that? Hands would be probably number two, because you're playing in the dirt. What's number three? Legs. Good guess. Probably not. What was that again? Legs. But you're getting closer. The butt. The butt. Why the butt? Because you, you sit down and kids don't always wear diapers. <laughs> you, you look at me like crazy. I feel like that's abuse. Uh, sometimes you just give up. I can't keep diaper on the kid. Fine, <laughs> run around. <laughs> you give up. Fine, run around. But yeah, they're going to be, it's, they're associated with sore. So yeah, skin penetration. Lifespan in Decatur, three to five years. Ancelosma, it's only about a year. And that's going to have to be important for transmission. Right. How important is it? Well, we have this thing called arrested development that happens in an ancelosma. We're going to have a worm penetrate. J3 penetrates, gets into the body, and then it's going to shut down. And it's just going to stay there. All right. The host immune system might try to fight it, but the cuticle is pretty resistant. It's just going to say, I don't care. And then after a certain amount of time, that J3 is going to reactivate, complete its migration, and develop to the adulthood in the, in the gut. We don't see that in the cater. In the cater, it penetrates, undergoes the migrations, get to the, the, the gut, and approximately five weeks after it gets there, that's when you start shedding the eggs. All right? So what is this arrested development? Why do we see it in ancelosma but not in a cater? This arrested development is thought to function to increase transmission. Since this worm only lives a year, all right, since the worm only lives a year, you're going to produce eggs during a, a certain amount of time, you know, a certain period of time. If those eggs come out during a time of the year where you don't get a whole lot of rain, then all those eggs in the J1 will likely be lost because of desiccation. So that doesn't benefit the parasite at all. You're going to have a huge chunk of the population that's there consuming resources, producing eggs, but they don't leave any offspring because they all died from desiccation. So these areas where we find ancelosmum are normally in those areas that have a clearly defined wet season and a clearly defined dry season. So this stress development is a way to try to match egg production of our worm with good environment mental conditions. All right, so this is what I kind of diagrammed it as. So our worm gets in there, and then it's going to arrest the development. And the development is going to be up to 38 weeks. What triggers it? What gets them out? Good question. Good question. It's probably pre-programmed in the genetic code that certain, certain individuals will come out sooner, others will go later, so that way the individual has a good chance they're spreading out their offspring on, when, on how long they, they stay out. But I've diagrammed it as saying, we've got our wet season, that's our hashes, we've got our dry season, which is our, our red. So you've got an adult that has this period where they are developing, Here. They're developing and then they start producing eggs. All right? And all of these eggs are lost. All right? Yeah. You've got another individual that starts later. By the time they start producing eggs, they're all lost because basically all of the eggs are coming out during the dry season. If they happen to get it right at the tail end of the dry season, you have this period right at the end where you might be able to start producing eggs, but there's a lot of waste that happens. So if we kind of go down and say, okay, well, which ones are going to be around where we actually have a shot at producing eggs that will survive and develop? We're 
for ceiling with one, two, three, four, five. All right, maybe five. If we institute some sort of development, of development arrest, we get infected during, uh, or we're out in the environment at this point, but then we undergo arrest. So now what we've done is delayed our egg production at least long enough so that we do we are producing some eggs during the wet season. In some cases, we might be producing eggs to catch the end of one and the beginning of another. But we're staggering when they come out. Some of our arrestment is pretty short. Others are pretty long. Will some worms lose out? Yeah, they will lose out. But not all of them. All of them won't. We will have some that will survive and will still produce eggs. So where do they develop? They remain in the somatic tissue. They don't enter the lymphatic system or the circulatory system. They penetrate into the skin, maybe into the muscles, and they stop. And then they sit there. All right? And then all of a sudden, they just resume and they undergo their migration. What's the trigger? The trigger for this is the onset of the dry season. So as the worms are transitioning and growing, to get to that J3 stage, they will sense deteriorating conditions. And once they start to sense that, that will now start to predispose some of them to go into this developmental arrest period. All right, so if you get infected, or if the eggs come out here, let's say here, all right, they're in the wet season, all right, they're developing in the wet season, none of these will likely undergo a developmental arrest. But if they start developing here and get infected, they're noticing that the amount of water is dropping off. It's starting to dry out. So now we're starting to more likely increase the developmental arrest. So we're not producing eggs during our dry season. Or we're not an adult during our dry season. All right. So the whole idea here, we're trying to, to match egg production with good environmental conditions for our offspring, or for the juvenile stages. Questions? This is only for Ancelostoma. Nicator does not do this. All right. So where do we see hookworm? Both prevalence and intensity. So prevalence is percentage of individuals with hookworm, and intensity is how many hookworms you have. Uh, it's correlated with environmental conditions, and it's correlated with the use of night soil. All right, so I, we, we talked about night soil, and I clarified it here on this, on this figure, or on this slide. Yeah, night soil is all about using human feces as fertilizer. You're spreading the eggs out. If you have hookworms, you're spreading those eggs out around and you're more likely spreading it around some agricultural fields where you are now walking barefoot or at least have your hands and stuff in the soil, working the soil. The environmental conditions, again, these worms are going to feed and they are susceptible to desiccation. So they are more likely to survive and grow in areas that are, have loose, aerated, and moist soils. Right, so loose... Loose, aerated, and moist soils. Warmer temperatures speed up your development. So the warmer it is, the faster they'll grow. You do need oxygen, hence reason for having a loose type of soil. And the moisture reduces desiccation. So loose, aerated, and moist soils. Your ideal places tend to be wooded or forested regions. Why? Number one, the shade. The shade, even though it cools down the soil a bit, it's going to reduce the drying. Soils will remain moist for longer periods of time. Example, Southeast United States. Southeastern United States, where it used to be major problems. Major problems of hookworms. Now we still see it. We still see hookworms. But we've kind of reduced reduced it. What was one way in which we reduced hookworm infection? A 
We'll go through two ways. What's one way? What's that? Incru how did they do that? I'd say this is probably tied to hygiene. Definitely. Yeah, is that, do I have that? Um, yeah, I guess not. Uh, yeah, so uh, in Southeast, um, you didn't really have indoor plumbing in those a lot of poor areas. That's where hookworm was. Uh, you had outhouses. You had latrines. Kids hated using that. Why is that? Who's ever seen one? What's that? They smell. Uh, yeah, you could say they smell. You, I guess they get used to it. Have any of you seen vault toilets at like state parks? Or National Forests. National Forests was the last one that I've seen. A vault toilet. V A U L T. So that one's just like a hole? Yep. There's no light coming in? Yep. Yep. Exactly. In those vault toilets, it's, I don't know, like one of, like a set, like a big open septic tank is what I think of. But can you imagine kids looking at that and saying, I'm not sitting on that? <laughs> and what's their fear? Fall. They'll fall in, right? So, yeah, the Southeast ran a big campaign, a uh, billboard with two holes in it, a big hole and a small hole. And the, the, the slogan, slogan was, cut one for the kids. Cut a hole small enough for them to use to get them to use it. Because if they weren't using it, they were just out going out in the forest behind a tree, spreading hookworm eggs. What's another one? This helps for, for a lot of these. Um, concrete floors inside. Instead of having a dirt floor, pouring a con concrete slab. That's major, major improvement, and it's partially <laughs> related to hygiene. But the concrete floor is dry. Any eggs, larval stages, they can't survive. They'll just dry out. Last thing, shoes. Wearing shoes. All right, pathology. Three, we're going to break this down into three phases. A cutaneous phase, a pulmonary phase, and an, an, and an intestinal phase. All right, so the cutaneous phase, really little damage is done. You probably wouldn't notice it. They're really good because they slip through cells, they slip between cells, uh, and they also enter hair follicles. All right, so little, little issue. Uh, you could get a minor inflammatory response um, when once they penetrate into the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. So when, once they penetrate through the vessels, you may have a slight inflammatory response. Again, probably wouldn't notice it. Thing that could happen is you develop something called ground itch. Ground itch isn't, I mean, it, it's caused by the worm, but we're not responding to the worm. Instead, that worm, once it penetrates us, has brought in bacteria on its cuticle, and now our body's fighting to the bacteria. All right, so it's the introduction of pyogenic bacteria resulting in an urticarial reaction. Very medically related or medical terminology. What does this mean? Pyogenic is pus forming. It's basically what it is. So pus forming bacteria generates that pus response. Urticarial reaction is a fancy name for this. Slightly raised by the top, very itchy swellings. Like a bump that itches. Almost like a mosquito bite. Uh, this could be comparable to hives. I don't know if you've had uh, hives or serves, you know, seen them. Um, and oftentimes, if you get the ground itch, it's not just going to be the one. Normally, you start noticing it when you had a dozen or more of these J3s penetrate into your skin and bring these bacteria in. One could just be, uh, something's there. Must have pricked myself. Who knows? 
All right. Cutaneous phase. That's what this guy's getting nailed. Not really. Sand is a, is a poor vector for hookworms. But you could get it. It stays damp. All right. Pulmonary phase. This is, coincides with when the J3s arrive in the lungs. So they're undergoing this tissue migration. They get to the lungs, the capillaries around the al alveolar spaces. They burst out of those vessels into the lung space. All right. And then from here, they're going to migrate up to the glottis. Now, each place where a J3 emerges is going to cause a very slight hemorrhage. I mean, really slight. For one of these, you're not going to you're not going to notice. For 12 of them, you probably won't notice. But for a heavy infection, where you get hit with a lot, and they're all emerging at about the same time, that simultaneous escape can cause pretty severe inflammatory reaction in the lungs. All right. And that inflammatory response in the lungs could include some fluid buildup leading to pneumonia. And again, possibility of bacterial pneumonia then, once your immune system starts to, to get compromised and so forth. All right. But that's only in a severe infection. Usually, phase is asymptomatic because they, they don't all come out synchronously, and it's only a couple at a time. But you can, and you do often, exhibit a dry cough and a sore throat. Why is that? As they're being swept up the lungs to the glottis, and, and, and well, up the lungs to the trachea, up to the glottis, you are getting some irritation. And that irritation then gets this dry cough and sore throat, which is, believe it or not, kind of beneficial. If you're going to cough and swallow and the worm needs you to do that, hey, they're, they're causing some of that. All right, that's our pulmonary phase. So far, nothing too bad. It's the intestinal phase. That's going to be our issue. All right, so the pathology of this intestinal phase is due to mechanical damage caused by the adults and the corresponding blood loss that is resulting from the mechanical damage in the feeding. All right, so it's tied to the feeding process of these worms. So starting at the mechanical damage, these hookworms are removing tissue. They are cutting and removing epithelial tissue. It's causing open wounds. All right, the open wounds open up the possibility of secondary infection. Your body, you are bleeding a little bit. Your body is spending proteins, spending energy to repair these wounds. And it's not just at a single place. These guys, these worms are going to be migrating in usually the anterior third of the intestine. So they're not going to cut one spot and stay there. They're going to cut, feed for a little bit, move to a new location. So you're constantly having this damage in the anterior third of the, of the small intestine. And your body is going to be constantly trying to repair this. But that's only the first part because what we're doing is cutting this tissue for the worms to get to the blood. They're feeding on the blood. How much they feed depends on the species of worm. So Nicator feeds at a rate of about 0.03 mils per worm per day which isn't much. Ancelosma feeds at a rate of about 0.26 mils per worm per day. Again, not much, but Ancelosma consumes quite a bit more. All right, when you look at how many worms you might have, this starts to add up. The blood loss starts to add up. And what you're going to do is start trying to regenerate, and you're not just trying to fix and repair the gut tissue, but you are regenerating uh, your red blood cells, utilizing the hemoglobin and the iron, utilizing the iron that you have to make more of this hemoglobin, leading to the possibility of iron deficiency anemia. So again, it's anemia, this time it's iron deficiency. Now, this is even though 
about 40% of the iron is going to be reabsorbed. So the blood or the, the worms eat the blood, they release some of that iron back into the gut, you reabsorb it. But you're still going to exhibit this just because of the massive loss. Not only that, but you see a decrease in plasma proteins because, again, you are trying to repair your gut, you're trying to, to repair your blood cells, and so forth. This intestinal phase is the most important aspect of our hookworm disease. And it's all tied to the feed, the mechanical damage and the blood loss. All right, we're almost done with hookworms. Big one. I'll leave that up. Uh, we're going to finish up hookworms on Friday and then move on to the next ones, which is Ascaris, Pinworm, and Camelitis. And hopefully we can get through Ascaris and start Pinworm. We'll see. Yep. That's the intent. Yes. That's the intent. We'll see what we get through on Friday. I don't know if we're going to include a Canthocephalus on that exam. Yep. Uh, don't forget, we have our next candidate coming in. His teaching demonstration is 9 o'clock tomorrow in CAV 100. His research talk is at Bio Lunch, so noon on Friday in 100. Yeah, this is the one? Yeah, I'm planning to uh, pick up some sand. So the water levels are still down, making it a little bit difficult. And uh, the water temperatures are still pretty low. So they should be warming up now. And this is about the time when we started last year as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll collect and we'll see what how many I can get. Thank you. All right. Thank you, have a good day. All right, you too.